Donald Trump called him tough. Rush Limbaugh read one of his articles live on his radio show. Ann Coulter tweeted that article to her one and a half million followers and declared, every sentence is perfect. Ladies and gentlemen, your host, former chief editor of the Jewish Press, Elliot Resnick. Denise McAllister is a journalist and a best-selling author. She's also the victim of cancel culture, conservative cancel culture. In 2019, Ben Shapiro, the supposed enemy of cancel culture, canceled McAllister for the crime of criticizing a homosexual man on Twitter too vigorously for her, his taste. To Ben Shapiro fans out there, this fact may be surprising and uncomfortable, but it's true. To learn more about this disturbing saga and to hear her take on the future of the conservative movement, we're honored to welcome Denise McAllister to the program. Now, Denise, I don't want to get into the nitty gritty details of all the tweets that led to your firing, but essentially you got into a Twitter war with Yasher Ali, a homosexual journalist who had criticized your relationship with your husband. I think the tweet that did you in was this one, and I'm going to clean up the last few words, um, if you don't mind. Just one. You wrote about Yasher. Sorry? It was just one word. <laughs> I know, but still, words. You wrote about Yasher, quote, he doesn't know his purpose as a man. He doesn't know his purpose as a human being. He doesn't know his purpose as an individual. So he wallows and tries to find himself by committing an unnatural sexual act. Sad. Ben Shapiro fired you in the wake of this tweet. What did he say to you and were you surprised? I was surprised uh, because what he said to me was, uh, I cannot have you threatening my brand. He has, I need to protect my brand. I don't like what you dumped on Yasher Ali you know, about his sexuality. So um, you need to remove yourself and we need to separate our alliance and any association between me and Daily Wire. And I appealed to Ben and I said, have you not been following the conflict? Because that tweet was at the end of a long kind of back and forth of mob threats from Yash Ali's Twitter followers that he had been encouraging and mocking my heterosexual marriage and, you know, mocking my sexual relationship with my husband, saying my husband was abusing me because I had defended masculinity and was uh, talking about masculinity in the feminist, anti-feminist context. And, uh, you know, Ben Shapiro's response was, it doesn't matter, uh, you know, this kind of uh, back and forth or language used against Yashar Ali attacking him in this way was unacceptable and he had to protect his brand. And he probably said protect his brand five times you know, in our in our dialogue behind the scenes. So that was eventually why he canceled me and wanted to separate from me as he had to protect his brand from someone who had attacked, appearingly, a, a homosexual man. Now, I think this is surprising to many people because Ben Shapiro, at least his image, is of somebody being a fearless warrior. He's always advocated not fighting the left's fire with fire, never backing down. And also for several years, he probably was only the only major conservative to be fighting the transgender movement. So it's almost hard for people to believe that he cares about money more than the issues. Is that what it's come down comes down to at the end of the day? I don't think it's about just about money per se. I mean, it is money ultimately when you're protecting your brand, but it's also your status and your reputation among your peers and, and those that he valued their opinion. One thing you've got to understand, there's a difference between fighting the transgender movement and fighting LGBT. Those are two different things. Ben Shapiro will fight and say he's against gay marriage. He will fight to the death and like in many different ways go against transgenderism. You will not hear him go out strongly and attack homosexual identity. People who say that homosexuality, same-sex attractions, having sex with the same sex is an identity. He won't come out strongly and say that that's an abomination as it does in Leviticus. He does not come out and speak strongly against that as God's created order for humanity, as we know from God's created order, from the Torah, from everything that God has revealed to us about his, his design for sexual human relationships being between a man and a woman. Uh, you will hear him say marriage itself as an institution should not be uh, between same-sex uh, couples. He will say uh, things about the transgender movement, but he will not come out and condemn homosexuality and that uh, paradigm and that identity as being sinful and wrong and something that we need to stand against in our culture.
At least I have not he heard him do that in years. He may have done that years ago before the same sex ruling and before he became a more powerful entity in conservative media with a lot of investors and people within entertainment industry that he's trying to ingratiate himself to that is very filled with the homosexual uh, order <laughs> and, and agenda. So uh, recently he has not stood strongly against homosexual identity as being established as a norm. And it's very sad. And, and if he's not willing to do it, he should at least let people around him do it. I mean, you know, that there's that old saying, I think that, you know, I don't remember exactly how it goes, but everyone to the left of me is some crazy liberal and everyone to the right of me is a right wing fanatic. And I always think it's a very dangerous attitude to have. If somebody's a little bit to the right of you, okay, so he's a little bit to the right of you. Give him some space. What exactly the, the lane that you're in is, is the exact perfect truth and nobody could be to the right of you, even a slightly, you know, slight shade. Well, what, what I found interesting about this situation, it wasn't like I wrote an article for Daily Wire that, or for anyone. I wasn't working in a professional capacity to oppose and make an argument uh, against homosexuality as an identity, which is the problem of our age. You know, uh, we do not, as religious people, establish our identity as human beings according to our own subjective perceptions. It's determined by God's created order and God's design. And that's where society being a civil society is established. Uh, you know, so I wasn't I wasn't writing about this. I wasn't working for Daily Wire during this time. I wasn't uh, in that capacity speaking this way. I was in a Twitter fight in a reaction to someone who had attacked my family because of a tweet I said that had nothing to do with him uh, that had to do with against feminism. So it, it's interesting that Ben so fiercely uh, and self-righteously condemned me when it didn't even have to do with professional or making a professional stand. It was a personal fight against someone who, who was bringing down my family and attacking homosexuality, I mean, heterosexuality, attacking legitimate marriage. So I, I find it, I can only assume this was personal with him, some kind of concern about his relationship with Yashir Ali, wanting to establish that, you know, what, uh, open relations with L the LGBT community and not wanting to confront it head on for the perversion that it is. So I, I don't know what was going on in Ben's mind about why he reacted so strongly uh, against this when it was clearly just a social media brawl and mob <laughs> that we've experienced it. Uh, anyone who's been in conservative media has experienced that. It wasn't the language I used. I mean, Ben Shapiro uses harsh language and bad language and drops F-bombs and you know, does this kind of thing. It wasn't, I wasn't fired for bad manners and not being nice. Uh, you know, I, one thing I respect about Ben Shapiro is he, he does the fight. He doesn't back down and uh, he, usually. So it wasn't any of that. It, it was something very specific about the offense to this man and about the delegitimization that I did of his homosexual identity that really hit him. And he did not want his brand associated with that kind of delegitimization of the homosexual identity. So uh, I, I, that concerns me as someone who is a strong voice in our culture. And it is one of the problems of our age. It is the conflict of our age uh, when it, the uh, determining our own identity as human beings. It's, it's an, a conflict between objective reality and subjectivism which I thought was something that Shapiro, you know, this moral relativism and this kind of thing was something that he fought, but he seems to be opening doorways to this and, and uh, with his embracing uh, intolerance in a bad way of, of this identity, this new identity that's born of subjectivism. And it concerns me. Right, right, right. And it became an international news story. I was just thinking about it earlier today. I was thinking to myself, just for that reason, he probably should have just hired you again, just to upset the left. A good sign in general, that if, the, if something upsets the left, you know it's probably the right thing to do. So if the whole left was so excited over your firing and it became an international news story, I think headlines in Germany and England, just for that, he should have just hired you back, just, just, just for that reason. All right, I want to talk to you a bit about morality, because this country can survive higher tax rates. It can survive socialized medicine. It can even survive ridiculous fees on carbon emissions. It cannot survive, however, the breakdown of morality. Spiritually, it cannot survive. Anyone who reads the Bible and takes it seriously knows that. But even leaving religion aside, society cannot survive, like you said, without objective morality and objective reality. If truth is not transcendent, if truth comes not from without, but from within, then every individual is the source of his own truth, and every individual is free to follow his own law. So if I desire another man's wife, I commit adultery with her. If I desire another man's watch, I take it from him. If lying will help me achieve my goals, I lie. 
And soon everyone lives in a man-eats-man world rife with corruption and violence. Now, I think conservatives know all this, and yet hardly any major conservative ever talked about morality. You are one of the only ones. How do you explain this dereliction of duty on the part of conservatives? And much more importantly, what can we do to change the state of affairs? Well, I think when it comes to conservatism today, it has it's lost its religious and moral mooring and, and center. It, we've become, uh, or it, the movement, and has become more secular and more materialistic with our culture. There's been cultural drift uh, and it's affected even the right. And we see it everywhere. And I think the way it's done that is, is through entertainment, through, uh, you know, these, the culture that we have, educational systems where it's not the family and the family values and our religious institutions that are guiding our ways. It's social media, it's entertainment, it's the music industry, it's, lit, it's literature, it's our education, which is completely secularized now. And so it's infiltrated and nudged us purposefully away from our religious center. And, and then we've embraced moral relativism, even if we don't want to. So we've moved away from the family, from the morality of the individual between God and the individual. One thing people need to understand, there's a reason why John Adams and the founder said that the Constitution is made for moral and religious people and it is made for no other is because without, like you said, an objective truth, objective morality, an objective center and direction for how humans are to behave, what human society is supposed to be. If that does not come from God and it comes from man, then, then we are at the whim of whoever is the most powerful. Then we're just in a Marxist struggle of power. Our rights come not from man, but from God, because our identity, our, our sense, our, our design, our, our created order comes from God. So if we abandon God as our center for truth, our, our way of being, our, our identity, our rights will go that way. And then all you have is tyranny. But we as a society ha have decided that our way is better. You know, we're more concerned about making people think that we're really loving and that we're really kind and that we're really tolerant. And so we want the approval of man more than we want the approval of God. So our democratic principles that we value so much have actually been used against us. You know, tolerance, justice, fairness, equality, all these things have actually been moved to be used and manipulated against our understanding of God being the definer of justice, definer of what's equal, the definer of identity, and a definer of what we are to tolerate. Because we are not to tolerate wickedness and evil. Uh, and so how we incorporate that into our social institutions and our society has been lost and we've abandoned it. And it's we see it, especially with the sexual sins and the, and the sexual immorality. I, I, I don't want to sound like a prude. I'm certainly not, but there is a reason why that's so much of an intensity now, because it is a segue of, of wickedness to get into the heart of man to determine him for himself his own way. When our God has created us to be and direct us in a certain way and in, in certain human relationships to secure our freedoms, you know, to secure civility, to secure order. And that starts with a marriage between a man and a woman. And when that's and that's sex and that's sexuality and that's the context for it. And so when that is shredded, it, it unmoors, you know, the family and, and human relationships from everything. We see that with the family, right? The family's being broken down. Now we, you know, fathers don't matter. Mothers don't matter now. Kids are being raised with, you know, being born, being created without, you know, any relationship to the mom and any relationship with the dad through sperm donor and surrogacy and all this kind of thing. So we, we're, we're completely shredding the very foundations of liberty the constitution and morality. And it's all because we want to feed our egos and feed our desires and be approved by our, our fellow man as being tolerant, wonderful, and fun people. The question I, is how do we fix this? And especially, I don't have any hope right now for the left fixing it, but we on the right at least should be talking about this more and hardly anyone is. Do you have any thoughts about how we get back to us on the right talking about these issues rather than avoiding them? Well, we need to be fear, fearless you know, and not be so fearful of the culture. And we need to start that in our homes with each other, in our friendships and our relationships and take back the dialogue 
fearlessly about what right and wrong is and not be intimidated and, and cowered into silence. And it's hard when you're doing it as an individual. If you're just one person standing on the street, you're going to be you're going to be canceled. You're going to be silenced. That's what was so frustrating and has been for me for the last three or four years since this cance canceling is that you cannot speak again, you know, out against these lies and against this immorality alone and have your own side turn against you. We have got to come together as religious moral people to speak boldly to a depraved, a wicked culture and not be afraid of the loss and, and back people up. And, in, and we're not any of us are going to be doing this perfectly. We, we are so afraid of, oh, well, she said the wrong thing or she didn't or he didn't handle it the right way or he doesn't believe exactly as I do doctrinally or, or whatever. But we do need to understand that there are some core principles about reality and the created order and religion and morality that we can come together and speak against a completely hedonistic, a completely morally relative, and a, a completely subjective culture. And we can't silence and cancel each other in that, in that, and judge each other so harshly in that. You know, we, we have got to be able to speak these truths fearlessly, and we just simply aren't. And while these money issues, you know, socialism is a big concern and all these, I, I, I'm with you. I mean, we can fight these battles. These are terrible things in our culture that we need to fight. But these fundamental core things about human relationships, human identity, morality are, are so important because God is the one who designed our culture. God is the one who designed this world. God is the one who created us. And if we deviate from him about how we are to treat one another, which is what morality is, right? Morality is the law of love. And it's about human relationships. That's what it is. It's not just a legalistic set of laws. It's about how we engage with one another in true love as God has designed it. If we abandon his law and we abandon his, his code, we abandon love and we abandon respect for one another. And that's my concern here is that in the name of love, we're abandoning real love. In the name of tolerance, we're abandoning truth. In the name of individualism, we're abandoning the community that God has created, uh, you know, in his image. So we need to be fearless. What do you think of the younger generation of conservatives, people like Candace Owens, Jesse Kelly, Buck Sexton, Charlie Kirk? I personally think they understand the left much better than the older generation and are willing to fight back with much greater vigor. I was wondering what you think. In some issues, they are. And some, but not on these issues. None of them. They're very willing to fight against critical race theory, you know, or socialism. And it, they're even out there fighting against transgenderism and, uh, you know, canceling of people who seem to sound like they're racist. They are not willing to stand up against the deep immorality of our culture and the attacks that it has on the family. They'll fight about abortion and stuff like that, but they will not fight, uh, you know, gay people creating babies out of, you know, sperm donors and surrogacies, creating these, you know, brave new world kind of Huxleyan families that undermines the very essence of society. <laughs> and uh, that's that concerns me that they're not willing to stand up on the on the moral issues of human relationships. But they're fighting about, right. you know, these other things that I, I find very easy to fight about socialism and arguing with the Marxists every day and putting down critical race theory. And, you know, transgenderism is an obvious, you know, thing to, to go against. But, but going those are mentally ill people and there are not many of them. But let me and, and it's right. a danger in our society when it comes to being able to say I'm a man when I'm not a man and a woman. It's, it's kind of the logical progression of subjectivism. Uh, I can be whatever I want to be. One thing I've, I've told them is if you're fighting transgenderism and not fighting homosexuality, you're at odds against your, yourself because they're both subjective sexual identities based on human will and human affections and human perceptions, not on God's design. One supports the other. So if you're fighting part of the culture war, but not the whole culture war, and I find this especially with millennials like you're talking about, yeah, they, they may be up there fighting against socialism and speaking out against it, but they're not turning to their... I, I, I'm sorry, I've just been in conservative media. They're not behind the scenes going to their friends and saying, I'm going to stand up against the immorality. In fact, they're they're indulging it. They're, it's, conservative media is so right with, rife with um, immorality itself. 
that there's so much hypocrisy in that. They just, they can't, they, they, they are not willing to make that stand. And we need people who are really willing to make the stand, but they don't because you sound like a prude. You sound like a really horrible person. You sound so judgmental. You sound so nasty and um, you're not really fun at parties. <laughs> you know, and we don't really want you at the cocktail party when I'm my homosexual friend who's giving me lots of money for my brand is there. You know, you need to be quiet about that. It reminds me back in the 90s. Remember back in the 90s when the conservative Republicans especially were like, we don't want the people who are pro, um, pro-life pro at our meetings. They embarrass us. We don't want those religious types. They really, really embarrass us. Um, somewhere along the way, because of the fight, and because of a lot of other things, being pro-life became a little bit more cool. And when that happened, the fight became more cohesive. See, it's it's just not cool right now among conservatives and these voices to be anti-LGBT or fighting the culture war against those who attack the family, really attack the family and, and attack marriage and attack the fundamental relationships of liberty. That's not cool. It's not nice. And so they just don't like it. So you don't see that war being waged among these people. In fact, you see the opposite happening. You see them bringing bringing in and justifying it and saying it's all cool. It's all fine. As long as we're fighting socialism together, we're one big happy tent. I always say that it's a miracle that half the country still votes Republican, considering that the left has a near monopoly on mainstream media, on academia, public school education, Hollywood. You're a Christian, so you certainly don't need me to tell you about the famous quote by St. Ignatius of the 16th century. He said, quote, give me a child until he is seven and I, and I will show you the man, end quote. Now, maybe he was exaggerating, but essentially most adults hold the values that were instilled in them when they were young. Since this is true, why in the world do we let liberals run our schools? And why are there only one or two conservative colleges in the entire country? Shouldn't it be 50 or 60? And again, much more importantly, what can we do to change this state of affairs? Well, it used to be, you know, conservatives and the religious ran the schools, ran the, the colleges. I mean, Yale, Harvard, those were religious institutions at one point. People forget that. Uh, I, I went um, and read some really, really old New York Times articles um, about, uh, oh, it was just amazing, the religious language that was just even in our media that was so upfront, right there, uh, no apology. That was the way of thinking. That was the worldview that, that we had. We had a religious, God-centered worldview. And that has been progressively, literally progressively, philosophically, abandoned through the years to the point that conservatives, religious people, Christians, Jewish people who are truly Jewish and Orthodox and hold to the morality of it, not liberal Jews, you know, are um, and secular have, have withdrawn from these institutions, um, cloistered away from it and just kind of given up the, the authority and the moral authority of, of the society to the left. And so now our, our probability, you know, our, our plausibility structures, our uh, you know, understanding of moral authority and who has moral authority it has changed so that now it is, like you said, uh, you know, a liberal paradigm, especially about these moral issues. It is amazing to me that, that there's not more of a leftist dominance. I think that's coming. I think you still have a couple of generations that are, you know, at the core capitalist. We do have individuality that, that runs against the hardcore liberalism that you see. You see it in the South. You see it in these red states. You know, you, you still have that independent individual spirit that at least on that level is fighting liberalism. Uh, but I, I think even in that, you don't see even those who are fighting for individualism. You're not seeing them having a great understanding about fighting for morality and fighting for objective truth. They just don't want to be told what to do by a bunch of liberal crazies in Washington. Uh, that will only hold for so long. And I, I think we have a wave with millennials and, with, and these upper, up and coming generations that are super liberal. And you see it in their voting. You see it in all the metrics of society. You see more divorce, less marriage among these groups. Uh, you know, as the boomers die out, as um, Generation X dies out, you're, you're going to have that become more and more dominant. So I don't have this positive view of the future that some of my ilk has. You know, they're really positive about, you know, it's going to get better. You know, we're going to have this. I, I don't. We may even even the winning and the, of, of Republicans doesn't always encourage me because I just see them as liberal light, you know, and, um, you know, they're they're not really fighting the real battles that are going to have long term uh, strength within the culture that will will secure our liberty. So, uh, yeah. 
I'm with you. I'm surprised it hasn't happened as badly yet, but I think that's because, you know, we do have an independent American democratic spirit of individualism. And I think that's holding strong against this hardcore socialism that you see rising up out of the uh, colleges and institutions. But I think that that wave is going to come and take over. So what do you see ha happening in the future and what could we possibly do to try to stop it? <laughs> I mean, it's an ebb and flow. I mean, I do think, you know, it's not a steady, direct trajectory, um, you know, toward destruction. But I do think that if you look at our culture, if you look at the history of human societies throughout human history, societies that uh, you know have abandoned these core relationships in marriage and the family dissolve and disintegrate. They, they become uncivilized and they become lesser because of it. So that's our trajectory. And you can look at a whole history of the human narrative to, to get support of that trajectory. So I don't see a positive trajectory, uh, you know, going forward unless there's a major change. So I, I, there has to be a national repentance. There has to be, you know, people coming to their knees before God. And I, that can happen either through national, some kind of catastrophic event by God himself or, uh, you know, it can happen through revival, you know, a religious re revival where people wake up. It will be, have to be a kind of act of God, I think, at this point to w awaken the consciences of American, to wake them up out of their lethargy and their rebellion uh, against God. But I think it's going to take something to shake them up to make it happen. And that's the only way. Otherwise, I just see it as kind of marching on with an ebb and flow. We'll have some victories here and some victories there, even the pro-life against the, you know, Roe v. Wade. I mean, that's a great thing that that federal, you know, it's no longer a federal right. And it was removed from, you know, Roe v. Wade was reversed. But in the states, you still have the battle against, you know, pro-abortion. You know, babies are still being killed across the land. And so it's still a battle. And so it's, it's this moral battle is always going to be ongoing. And I think just conservatives like you, like me, like many people just need to continue to be strong and speak out against the immorality of our age. Right. I was speaking to someone the other day who said it's hopeless. That's it. We're going downhill. And I was thinking to myself and I said, well, I always try to have some hope. But I said, look, even if you are right and even if we do go downhill, the question is what happens after afterwards after let's say america goes down the drain what comes in its wake so if you're not fighting along the way you I mean you rick lart not you personally if we are not fighting then what comes in its wake could be very bad if we're fighting at least we'll be there when the collapse comes to possibly build something good in its wake so i don't know that's have some sort of creative destruction it, you know and it's you know out of the ashes rises the phoenix right so and um, we see that through the uh -huh. the dark ages you know there was lots of loss, but you have this stream, this thread, you know, of, of God sustaining his people. And he, and that's what I always come back to. I, ultimately, my hope is not in this world. It's not in, in the United States. I, we live in a participatory republic. And so I'm not, you know, for the Benedictine option of kind of abandoning culture and, and going off and cloistering among ourselves. But, uh, you know, I want to participate. Yet my hope is not in the United States. It's not in this culture. It's not in the West. It's not in this world. My hope is in my God, you know, my savior, my, the, the one I follow. And, and he is ultimately king of this world. And that's what David recognized all through his kingship. You know, I, he bowed down constantly, you know, that you are the king. You, you make the nations bow before you. God created this world. He will destroy it or he will raise it up or he will reform it. This is, he is the one in control. And ultimately my obedience, my concerns need to be about my, um, service to him ultimately. And then out of that service and obedience to him will come any kind of way that he will use me in the culture and in my family and in the relationships that I have around me. So we really have to look first in the mirror and look and, and as we are on our knees before God and say, who am I before you? I do not belong to myself. I belong to him. He is my creator. He is my Lord. And uh, so he is the one that I am to obey. And, and the more people who do that, the more you have cultural change. It really does have to start right. with the individual. Indeed. Okay, last question. What, you, you're banned now from the Daily Wire, the Federalist, from Fox News. What do you do now? <laughs> well, for me personally, I mean, one thing I do want to make clear, I do talk about my canceling and I'm on shows 
periodically to talk about it and people ask me about it. And some people have asked me, why don't you drop it and not mention it anymore? One reason is I don't mention it because I'm trying to get a job back in conservative media. I think that's gone. That's not going to happen. When I mean get back into it, I mean someone paying me to do the work. I, there's a lot of places I can do stuff for free. <laughs> As you know, on the internet, there's a lot of places to do things for free. But uh, so I, because of my family situation, I don't have the luck. I have to earn a living. So I have to work another job. And that's my focus right now. My focus right now is to take care of my family and support and help support my family and contribute to my family financially. And I cannot do that because of the canceling. There's no one coming to me saying, hey, Denise, will you write for us and we'll pay you such and such so that you can actually have a job. And because these things do matter. And, and so I, my goal is mainly on my free time and when I can help encourage others to be aware of what the cancel culture is, to be on guard against those, even in our own ranks, who are not being faithful to the commitment uh, to what really makes a strong and civil society and a free society and to be aware of where we're putting our focus and also to encourage people to be strong. Don't be afraid to speak up in truth. Don't be afraid of fear of association. Don't be you know, afraid of these people who are threatening to silence you because you're talking to so-and-so. This is, this is how you, you delegitimize and stigmatize and uh, you know, whole groups of people and don't, don't allow that to happen. And, and speak truth, support one another. Don't let the canceling happen. So I, I really see myself more as an encourager now and someone who really wants to call others to arms to, to work in their sphere and to be fearless in doing it and, and speak out and gather in groups and, and, and do what you need to do to speak out before things get worse and persecution really comes. Because when you are delegitimizing whole groups and when you're stigmatizing whole groups of people, then they become dehumanized. And when you dehumanize groups of people, then you can do anything to them. And their liberty doesn't matter, their rights don't matter, their voices don't matter. Silencing voices leads to silencing lives and ending lives. And so I'm very concerned about that kind of thing in the long term. And so I, I just wanna speak out against that. But as far as me and writing and conservative media and all that kind of stuff, that's just not really <laughs> something that's on my plate right now. Right. Thank okay. You, well, you still have. A... <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, you still thank God have a nice social media following. Sixty thousand followers on Twitter, I believe. And it's a miracle you're still on Twitter, by the way. I don't know how that happened, but I have fifty-two. Continue, but... I used to have eighty. So you know. Oh. Um, I, I don't think Twitter messes with me much anymore because they know I don't have any power and I really don't have a voice. Yeah, I have this following, but I think I, I'm really convinced that maybe fifty thousand of them um, have me on mute. So... <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's, I just, not the, uh, it's not the powerful platform you think it is uh -huh. well you're not on mute on my feed so uh, <laughs> you're welcome all right i really appreciate your time thank you so much for joining us today well thank really you appreciate it